welcome to a brand new episode of Coming Distractions brought to you by the Nerd Apocalypse Podcast. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm here with my co-host this week, Carrie. What's up? All right, guys, we're back. Um, this is going to be a review of the entire series of WandaVision, um, newly finished on Disney+. Plus. Uh, obviously, this is Marvel's first uh, MCU-centric um, show. Um, so this will be a, an in-depth review. Uh, this is spoilers. Spoilers abound. <laughs> yes. So if you haven't seen WandaVision, <laughs> by all means, please go watch it um, or stop watching this um, and then go watch it and come back. So uh, we're going to kind of go through our th- initial thoughts of it, what we thought of it was going to be, a you know, like how we thought it was going to be, what it ended up being, um, character breakdowns, um, thoughts of that world, our favorite moments our suggested improvements or things that we thought could have been improved. Uh, if we have any, how it fits into the overall MCU and then those char- some of those characters going forward inside the MCU. So, um, all right. Initially, uh, what were your thoughts versus overall thoughts at the end? So initially, like I've been sort of apathetic about Wanda. Um, like I'm not a huge Scarlet Witch fan as far as the comics are concerned, Um, And, like, I didn't have this, like, great emotional attachment to her in the MCU. I thought she was, like, cool, but, like, I didn't have this sort of, like, oh, I love her character in the MCU sort of, like, emotional attachment to her. Um, I liked Vision more, but I also liked Vision in the comic books a lot. Um, I think Paul Bettany's great. Um, So, like, I was looking forward to WandaVision as a series, but I wasn't expecting to be like blown away by it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I'm obviously going to watch it because it's MCU, but I was sort of like shrug about it uh, <laughs> when they That's kind fair. of announced it. And then like my overall thoughts now is like, I loved this series. Right. Boy, did uh, I not Wanda's, see that coming, right? Wanda's journey, like through her grief and her journey to fully awakening her powers as the Scarlet Witch. Um, The way that the show was handled was just like so compelling. I love seeing all these different sides of these characters that we didn't really get to spend a lot of time with in the features, you know, like Mm -hmm. they, they were outside of like the core six Avengers. So we didn't spend a ton of time with them in like civil war and infinity war and whatnot. So it was nice to be able to, spend a lot of time with them to spend like a cumulative like four or five hours with them through the series so i'm like way more invested in wanda now i'm way more invested in vision than i already was before and i love the characters that they introduced right in this so right. um yeah i feel uh pretty much the same i i didn't care about wanda any more than like, oh, that was a that was a cool moment in Endgame, right? And then, right, and like sort of her and uh, Pietro's uh, initial uh, introduction um, in Age of Ultron. So yeah, I was kind of like, that's fine. Look, at that point, you know, we're post Endgame, so I'm like, whatever they're gonna throw out, I'm sure it'll be super interesting, and <laughs> right. they'll, they'll convince me that I should care about these characters. Um, but I certainly didn't have any sort of built in like it's a big difference for me knowing like Falcon and the winter soldier are coming up because like oh, I'm yeah. way more invested in those characters pre the series um, than I ever was for Wanda and vision. Although again, I like them and, and it's not like, Oh man, this is a series of characters I hate. Like it wasn't like that. Right. I, it wasn't like, I was like, why would they dare do right? Uh, I was, I had like, my interest was piqued by this, but it like, I was way more looking forward to Falcon and winter soldier than I was looking for one. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, and I, and I agree by the end of this, they gave, they allowed this show to do what I think the Mandalorian did for star Wars, um, which is give so much more depth that like fill in the gaps in a lot of ways, right? Not just about these characters, but like, I enjoyed Age of Ultron just fine. I don't think it's like a terrible movie or whatever. I think it's the weakest of the Avengers movies, but that's like, what is that saying? Right. Like, right. Right. Like it's, oh darn, it's, it's, it's the good the worst one. of these three pieces of cake. Like, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's oh still man. A piece of cake, right? right. It's still like, a delicious piece of cake. So like, I definitely thought it was the weakest, but I still enjoyed it quite a lot. And this helped to really fill in some gaps, I think for a lot of people. Um, 
And it just kind of made that movie feel like, oh, okay, like there's a lot more there, um, even though I enjoyed it. So um, I appreciated that about the series, if nothing else. And these series, and I and I think these forthcoming other uh, Disney Plus series, will just help to make the MCU feel more full. And it'll also just help to boost up characters that didn't get as much screen time, like Hawkeye being a big one. Like that's, that's like the biggest example. Cause he like really didn't do anything in the MCU. And now he's, he's going to, even though he's sort of co-hosting a series, it'll allow you to go a little deeper on that character, which I think is overdue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that's sort of initial thoughts versus overall, um, by the end. Um, so as far as like a, just a, a, a breakdown, um, of this series, like the series deals so heavily with grief and Wanda's yes. particular grief in the stages of grief. Um, I thought that was a really cool aspect, right? That's not like post the blip. There's so many characters who have suffered these tremendous traumas. And overall, that's what the series is about. And I think that's one of the things that people may have not quite understood in the beginning, uh, as as it progressed i think it became more obvious but yeah um for for me like the the concept of like grief sort of being for for lack of a better word the villain of right. of the series that that grief is this thing that wanda is fighting against from the get go um I find that far more compelling than, you know, all these people who kept expecting Mephisto or wanted Mephisto to show up by right. the end or anything like that. Um, it's, um, I mean, Wanda as a character experienced such a profound amount of loss in such a short period of time. You know, she lost her brother, followed very quickly by the loss of Vision a couple years later when Vision was the one to pull her out of her grief after she lost Pietro and then she gets snapped out of existence for five years. And then she has to come back and see that not only is Vision still dead, but he's been dissected like a, you know, like a piece of machinery. Right. Because um, S.W.O.R.D. only values him for the fact that he's made out of vibranium. Right. Um, that's tough. Like, well, that's... And, and, you know, let us not forget, she watched him die twice. Right. Yes, like exactly. not even just like, once. She had to kill him first. <laughs> and then watch and then re-round. had to watch as Thanos reround time to kill him a second time. Like yeah. just horrendous, you know, yeah. horrendous. And and I feel like having grief being the driving force with Agatha also there to serve as like not a villain, but like an antagonist. And I'll get more into Agatha momentarily. Right. But, you know, uh, I think it was like a variety interview that came out in the past couple of days um, with the showrunner. Yeah. Jack uh, Schaefer or yeah. Jack, Jack. I think it's Jack Schaefer, but either way, go ahead. Yeah. uh, Yeah. So the, the idea of um, yeah, Jack Schaefer, they, they sort of described this, the, this fan reaction of um, just where's Mephisto like that, that that was sort of this leading fan theory and that people were somehow disappointed that Mephisto never showed up. Um, right. It, it almost feels a little misogynistic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in, that was my, that was my number one reason why I didn't think he was showing up is because yeah, why would you undercut these powerful female characters uh, yeah, with like and the devil man like that seems that seems we don't need a male villain in a show about one female power but also just female grief right it doesn't have to um, be centered around a dude right. so yeah grief grief was enough and grief was compelling so yeah and, and look i i think it's i i think it's a interesting way to tell a story and i i wonder if grief and sort of this post trauma is a is the is the through line for at least this falcon and the winter soldier and hawkeye right like characters who existed before the blip and were superheroes and everything else and like what they experienced and what that trauma that like sort of ptsd is going through beating the bad guy and then coming out 
Like, I wonder if that's a, th- a through line. Because I think it would be fascinating that all, you know, these characters all experience it, but how in how in which ways do they experience it, right? Like, Right. And it, how do they react to it and how do they handle it? Right. Are they processing it healthy? Because Wanda sure did not. She did not. No. Fuck no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, and then you have, like, how she processed it and then how Falcon and the Winter Soldier are processing it by, like, like this macho nonsense between them where they yeah. both are like, dude, we're this is like really hard for us. And they're going to probably have to come to terms with like, we got to kind of deal with this more open and honest, right? Like they're literally in therapy at one point, right? Like, I think that's kind of obvious. <laughs> right. they're, and they're like in couples therapy, right? Like how does, how does like, how do dudes handle this? Like, ah, oh, you know, like, like the right. BS behind it, like how to do handle it and come out of it and still be an actioner and be fun. Um, and, you know, that's sort of almost like couples therapy that they deal with. And, like, how did Hawkeye deal with it? Because he, like, lost his whole family. Like, Hawkeye lost his whole family and then turned into a murderous vigilante for a few years. Right. So. Like, and that guy seems to, I mean, again, this is just, you know, spitballing. But that trauma seems to be handled by, I want to get out of this. And I need, I need to pass it on to somebody. I need to pass on my, you know, what I do. When things are normal, I need to pass it on to somebody because I'm too messed up. I got to get out of it. But like, it's also a daughter figure, right? Like, so that connects to his family loss and stuff like that. So that's That's interesting. interesting. And there's, I didn't think about that for Hawkeye. I sort of considered it for Falcon and Winter Soldier, but that's, that's an interesting thought for Hawkeye. That that dude was like, yo, my whole family's gone. Let me just go murder bad guys. (laughs) I'm just going to kill the whole Yakuza by myself. Right. Like, it was like, I'm bored. (laughs) I got, I got other things to do. So like grief is an interesting thing. And I, and I think you're likely to see it go through all of those. And that's fascinating. And then to introduce new heroes who don't have that grief and like, how do they deal with the world after that? Right. Like, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that grief was the, the villain, right. Or the, the through line through this entire series and like literally showing her mirror the stages of grief through sitcoms, right? Like yeah. that's just a fascinating, like for people to go, ah, I don't get it. And it's, it's lame. Like, now that you understand the ending, it might be worth going back to watch mm-hmm. it because I think you'd have a different appreciation for it as it unfolds. I've gone back and watched the earlier episodes um, for a few reasons, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, particularly knowing knowing how the series pans out to go back and to examine the first, re- really the first two or three episodes, sort of through that that lens of all right, well here's here's what's actually going on, right? Um. You, you pick up on some some little things. So. Yeah, and I, and I think that's powerful. And, it, like, I feel like the series, while I thoroughly enjoyed it the, the first time, I think you'd get even more out of it the second time, right? Like, sometimes knowing the mystery um, makes the mystery that much more interesting, right? Yeah. Like, it, it just kind of does. Um, let's talk about characters specifically. Um, I mean, we obviously talked about Wanda a little bit, um, but I want to I wanna deal with Wanda, Vision, Agatha, Monica Rambeau and Pietro and then the kids um, and then a couple of the side characters too, who I think are important. Um, look, Wanda is, is obviously the mainstay here. I thought Elizabeth Olsen did an amazing job. Like, if she doesn't get nominated for like an Emmy for this, I would be shocked. Um, mm-hmm. I thought she was fabulous. And same goes for really, Paul Bittany. For everyone example. in the main cast in, showed such a range. Like, yeah, in in how they were able to handle a 1950s Dick Van Dyke style sitcom, as well as they were handling like a 1980s Family Ties style thing, as well as they were handling like the true style of an MCU core story. Right. You know, just wild, wild stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of heavy lifting, actually, like from just an acting perspective. Like it really was, yeah. especially especially Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bittany. Like, a lot of heavy lifting for the two of them. Yeah, the like the expression of Wanda's grief um through Elizabeth Olsen like convincing, right? Like yeah, everything very. about it felt very sincere. Um it didn't feel like you were watching someone who was acting. It looked like you were looking at someone who had lost everything. Yeah. Um yeah, just so 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 good. Um I mean the evolution of the character um over the course of this series, I, I thought was I thought was great. Um, 
But like for me, it was nice. It was nice to see Wanda be funny, you know? Yeah, to have a couple of moments like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like I I liked the, you know, sort of modern family, you know, (laughs) moments. Yeah. yeah. She was just like, what are you going to do? Like, "Mm, yeah, sometimes your powers get crazy. Like, like I I appreciated the, I mean, it, it is like such a variable style through those decades. Like it was, it was dope. Like it was just really dope. Um, I thought Paul Bittany as Vision, like, he was great since we heard his voice as right, Jarvis, as Jarvis, right? Like, he's always been amazing. But for him to come all the way from that into this role where he's talking about the ship of Theseus, you know, in the right. end to himself <laughs> was incredible. Like, it was really quite good. And he well, can not, even, like, do uh, facial expressions that show a difference between him and himself as the same right. character, which was wild, too. So good. Um I mean, there's that, but again, like, why have we not seen Paul Bettany in a sitcom before? Like, yeah, he kind of like did, did it pretty well. Situation where yeah. it's just like he's so good, like he's so good in every single era that they put the show in. Yeah. Um, Little known yeah, fact: I mean, Paul Bettany once played the Unabomber in a series, and he was excellent. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. You should watch it. It's called <laughs> Unabomber. It's amazing. It's actually really super good. Yeah. Um. I mean, Vision was great. You're sort of. Uh. Wanda's vision versus like the true body of the of the vision. I'm very interested in seeing how vision um is post the series because we saw White Vision have his memories restored and he was just like, All right, I am out of here. Yeah, I, I have a lot five thousand. Yeah. I got shit I gotta figure out. Yeah, I got a lot to think about. <laughs> um because I mean what I think if if you've read the comics and you know that white vision doesn't have like the emotions or the personality. And I feel like that's sort of what we're going to deal with here yeah. with the resurrected vision that we now have somewhere in the MCU, who the hell knows where he went. Yep. Um, but we now have a vision with all of the powers and all of the memories of old vision, true vision, hex vision, whatever we want to call him. Right. Um, but none of the personality and none of the emotional attachment. So that's going to be interesting to sort of see unfold. Yeah. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I that. yeah, I have no idea where he's gonna pop up, but I have to imagine my guess is he pops up in another series at some point. Um hmm. before a movie, which would be fun. Like, hey guys, like, what are you doing here? Like, you look <laughs> different. You're acting way different. Um, so that, that could be cool, but yeah, I look forward to seeing that. I thought that was a nice way to end it with him. Um, Agatha, you, um, you have a few thoughts on Agatha, (laughs) (laughs) just a few. Uh, yeah. So like every alarm bell in my brain went off at like, I think it was like episode five, six, seven, somewhere (laughs) in there where I was just like. Oh, right. I'm gay. (laughs) It's like, it's terrible. Catherine Hahn's fabulous. No, she is. Look, I love her in everything. I mean, she's such a good actress. She's so good in everything she's in, whether it's, you know, I think she's known more for comedy, but she's done more, you know, she's done dramatic stuff as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah. What a compelling character. Agnes slash I, Agatha turned into by the end, though. Right. And the, one of the things that I liked so much about her character is that almost everyone got that guess right. They were just like, no, <laughs> that's Agatha, you know, that that's Agatha Harkness. Knock it off. Like, we saw the brooch. We got it. Like, it was the one thing that people got right. And I appreciated right. that. I was like, that's fine. And I liked that Marvel wasn't like, oh, let's change it. Like, they were like, all right, who cares? Yeah. Um, but they did something I thought was really interesting is by introducing Pietro, which which we'll talk about, they took everyone's eye off the ball for a second, right? Right. right? Because everyone's like, oh, <laughs> shit, like it's him. Distraction. It, right. It was a perfect, like, the series is written exactly like they run you right up to the line and you're like, oh, here we go. And then it's like, boom, here's this thing. And everyone's like, oh, I'm going to go over there. And by the time you take your, by the time you've taken your eye off of Agatha, Things are happening, but you're too concentrated on this red herring, which was very smart. Um, and just like well-timed in the series. Yeah. I mean, 
again, like Agatha is antagonistic. I would not qualify Agatha as a villain. No, no. she's not really a villain. No. no, I think she had some villain. She had some villain motivation there. Like, I just want your she, powers kind right. of thing. Like that was definitely villain. But like the rest but of it was like, let me just try to find out what's going on here. Right. I mean, that that was sort of the driving force to begin with was how did you do this? Right. Right. Um, but I think I think it was actually Catherine Hahn herself who said in an interview that it's like the the dynamic between Agatha and Wanda is like a Mozart Salieri kind of thing where hmm. um, Wanda is this naturally gifted, like all of her powers are instinctual and natural and they're just within her and she didn't have to learn it right. um, in the same way that Agatha did. And so there's this there's this inherent like jealousy that agatha has of wanda's natural abilities and um it's it's a complex sort of relationship where agatha easily could be the mentor that wanda probably needs to truly hone these abilities but at the same time all agatha really wants to do is take that power for herself because she thinks that she that she's earned it after you know 450 years of being a witch right right uh yeah, yeah I, and I, and i like that like i i like the idea that we could see agatha show up again and be um like i don't need them to be friends but i need them to no. be like frenemies <laughs> like you know yeah, what i mean exactly. like yeah show me some shit um all right cool thanks i'm leaving like can you let me out no <laughs> you know like <laughs> Like I like I'd like that. I would love I don't need Agatha to like turn to a good guy. Like I don't need that. I need her to be the same type of person she's always has been shown to be. Um sort of this like chaotic neutral presence of like yeah. I'm in it for me. Like Yeah, I'll help you because like the world's ending and you might need a couple of like little extra things right. in your in your backpack. I'm going to help you cuz it's in my best interest. Right. To help. I don't want the Not universe to it's blow up. It's in your up. best interest. It's in my best interest. Right. And and I like that about her character. Um and I like the way it ended, right? They didn't kill her. She isn't like banished to some zone she can never come back from. She's just no, stuck just in that town. Mind blanked. Yeah, like, you just stuck in that town. Um, and I appreciated that because that gives them an opening to touch on that character again because the character is really good. And I'd love yeah. to see her in movies. Like I would I mean, love to see it. At this point, obviously the breakout character of the series. Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So yeah, um, Monica Rambeau, uh, played by uh, Tiana uh, Paris. Um, or Tiana Paris. Um, yeah, look, I thought she was great. Um, I like that the way they gave her her powers, I thought was, mm-hmm. um, was interesting and unique, uh, from the comics. Um, I wanted more of that character. There's a lot going on in this series. Yeah. So I understand why we didn't get it, but I like that they sort of lined it, lined her up perfectly to go into Captain Marvel 2, um, it without having to like, like, we're going to, we're, we have this little golf ball of Monica Rambeau and we're going to put her on this tee and we will revisit her Yep. a little later. Right? Like, there's her powers. You can see what she can do a little bit. Not a lot. Right. Like, we're just giving you just, just a taste. Like, she doesn't really understand it yet. Right. We sure as shit don't understand it. Um, I thought she was great. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like that she shows up in the hex the first time we see her. And like they show that and it's like a little weird. And then then we get her outside, you know, outside the hex to kind of explain, you know, her sort of powers and thing, or, you know, sort of her situation. Her backstory. Her to backstory. See, to see her get unblipped. Yeah, that's the first I time we've seen. That's the first time we've seen the un, the unblipping <clears throat> in a non-comedic thing, right? They did it in right. Homecoming, which it was just played for comedy and it was hilarious. Um, but to do it. This time in this like panicked hospital and like that was like pretty that, crazy. That's what I sort of feel like the vast majority of the unblipping was like was just pure unadulterated chaos. Right. And just confusion. Right. Half the universe back where they were. Right. So, yeah, I, I thought that was I thought that was dope. Um, and, it, and it just allowed it, it. Like you said, it tees her up for. um the next time she shows up, which is in Captain Marvel 2, okay. Like, I'm I'm here for it. And I like that we don't have to take 35, 40 minutes or an hour of 
of plot in Captain Marvel 2 to find out Monica getting her powers or that happens in Captain Marvel 3. No, right. forget it. She already has powers. So she's, she's going to show powers. up. We know how she got her powers. We'll yeah. probably learn more about her powers. Right. We're moving on. Right. And like. We don't and, need the exposition. Right. We don't need all that. And that was that's a smart way to use these series, right? Yeah. To kind of bring up some of these characters. Like, you know, like obviously Miss Marvel later on is um, getting her own, you know, has her own series coming. Like, we're not waiting in someone else's movie to explain that. And then like kind of giving it like a half ass thing. But instead, you get it all done and then you can get right into the movies and get moving. Right. That's super yep. smart. Um and clearly her and Carol have some sort of issue. So that's going to be fun. It's yeah. It's it's interesting. I'll I'm curious to see like what sort of weird relationship those two have. Yeah. Um, my guess, my guess is it's a, it's a feeling of abandonment as her mom died Carol wasn't there. But Carol's on the other side of the universe trying to save the you know, save the universe right. too. So like they're going to do that thing of like, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. And then eventually it's like, we should probably sit down and talk about what happened. It's like, oh, that's what you're doing. Okay, cool. Therapy. I get it. Yeah. Gee, more trauma, more post blip trauma, right? So like huh. that actually, as I, as I say that, that might be what the through line is for all of the next phase, right? Like that all of these people me. dealing with. Like, you can't just ignore all the shit that happened, right? These 20 other movies. So um, that very well might be the through line of just these traumatic situations that have happened to these people, um, which makes them deeper characters. Yeah. Um, uh, Pietro, or uh, Fietro, Pietro. Um, played by um, Evan, Evan Peters, Peters. Uh, who also played um, Peter in uh, the X-Men uh, movies as Quicksilver. Look – Smart. I love this. I thought yes. it was great. It's a great red herring. If you're mad that he didn't turn out to be an X Men, that was the point. They're supposed to. They are supposed to dupe you. That was the point. That's the fun of the series. You weren't supposed. I mean, to that, that was the thing, right? Is uh, maybe maybe it was um, maybe it was what's his name, Matt Shackman. Um, someone. It was either Shackman or Feige who said in an interview recently where they were like. We knew we wanted to do this thing where her brother brother came back as like a trick. But, you know, we, we didn't just need it for like Wanda to be like, OK, this is my brother, question mark. But something's wrong or something's different. Um, like the, the everyone watching at home also needed to believe that that could have been Pietro. Right. And the only way that they could have done it was by casting Evan Peters. Right. Because you can't cast Aaron Taylor Johnson because it's like, oh, he's back. Like, like that feels too obvious. Right. Like um, casting Evan Peters kept everyone guessing. Yep. It, it it gave everyone the impression of. This could be Pietro like this. It might be because we, the people at home have the context of knowing that Evan Peters played Quicksilver in the Fox movies. Right. Um, but yeah, it's surprise. Brilliant. It's a <laughs> it brilliant great. piece of misdirection, a brilliant piece of casting. And if you're mad about it, um, good, good, good. Like, no, <laughs> because it, because it's, it's, it's a meta thing, right? Like it, it is meant if you're, if you're trying to get the, like, it's the exact opposite of what they did in Winter Soldier, right? Which is we're not trying to hide that it's Bucky from the audience, right? We already know you know the story. It, it's mm -hmm. actually irrelevant if you do or don't. The point is that it's a shock to Cap. Right. In this one, the point is that you, the audience, aren't supposed to know what's happening, right? Like it's a Twin Peaks -ish thing, right? You're right. you're going along with the mystery because you're like, well, what does any of this mean? Because the point of the show is the mystery. The point of the Winter Soldier movie isn't the mystery. Like, that's not the mystery. It's, it's right. Cap dealing with, like, modern time. So it's because they're trying to make a mystery for, you know, it's like Knives Out is a, is a really great example, if you've ever seen that, right? Like, yes. they didn't need to hide who the killer was because that wasn't the point. Like, that, they gave away who the killer was early because... Yes, it's a mystery, but that's not the part of the mystery that you're supposed to be concentrating on. You're supposed to be concentrating on this other part. And so that idea of making it a mystery to the character and to the audience 
takes a like that's a level of writing that takes real skill, right? Like making a mystery to a fictional character is is, is way easier. I'm not gonna say easy, right. but it's way easier. But that's to fool the audience, irony, like where right. the audience already knows, like right. But to fool the audience and to fool um, the characters in the show, and they right. aren't fooled in the same way by the same character is is fucking fascinating. Um, yeah. So that I thought that was really dope. I, I really did. Um, the kids. Uh, Wicked and Speed. Um, look, I thought it was fun. I, I thought it was cool having them age up and them showing up and in like in their quote unquote traditional sort of look, which I thought was, right. it was just cool. Um, I don't have much to say about it. I hope that they bring them back for like a Young Avengers. Like, I think that would be dope. Not yeah, necessarily I mean, those kids, I think the but the fact that we hear them calling out from within the metaverse somehow or within the Darkhold um, is. Uh, Obviously, that sets them up for some sort of return. In yeah, the that, that's what I think. Because obviously, Wanda's going to go looking for them. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I would, I mean, I think the probably the best thing is have her go looking for them, eventually find them, and they're the age that they are in that show. And then that kind of just goes away for a while. And the next time you see them, they're more Spider-Man's age or whatever. And then they can join Young Avengers. Like, that would yeah. be dope to me. Just pick different actors. Or, I don't know, they're teenage, they're like little, they're kids. By the time they show up again, they'll look 25. So it's, right. it's fine. Um, but I thought it was cool to include them. I thought it was great, great. Um, uh, other side characters, look, uh, Jimmy Woo and Darcy, give them their own series. Just give them their own series, please. please. Like, Come on. I would watch that. I love Darcy. Look, I, I mean, one of the things that is kind of dope is that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is over, which I loved. Um, but there, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. did this really well, which is touch on these characters that are like D-list characters in the MCU um, and kind of explore their stories. Yeah, give Jimmy and Darcy an X-Files type show. Yo, please. And just let them go and find like Gravitron <laughs> or some other wackadoodle characters that you're right. never going to put in the mainstream. And if somebody works super well on that show, make them a, you know, make them a little job or villain for somebody else, right? Like... But, like, have them go and, like, experience, like, other anomalies, especially, by the way, if if Jimmy Woo and Darcy are around, like, by the time mutants come around, like, you have them go and, like, like who is this, like, this mutant? Or, you know, like, you could have them break in characters that otherwise would never get time in the big movies or big series. Like, I like I think I think those two characters are – I think uh, Randall Park is hilarious. Like, that dude is – like, there is no reason that guy isn't a big leading man in, in comedies. Like, there's just, just no reason. I love that Jimmy did, like, the, the card trick that yeah. he learned from watching yeah. Scott Lang in the second Ant-Man film. Like, what a what a good little, like, so such a small little thing that just highlights how interconnected this world is, right? right. Like, and then him, you know, breaking out of the handcuffs and then just saying, Flourish. Flourish, yeah. <laughs> But that again, you're right. Like that shows the depth that which they're they're connecting these series, right? Like he's not just like FBI guy and they just like zero personality, right? Like or just like I'm a goofball. Like they gave him that's a part of his character. Is like this guy likes you know this guy loves magic. Like he just loves right. like you know up close magic. So like that's his that's his thing. So let's figure out ways to use that. That's dope. I, I that's really smart. And also Randall Park is a treasure, man. Like that guy is just super good. Right. Um and look, Cat Dennings. What's not to like? <laughs> What's not to like? Um no, uh I really one, hope we do see more of Darcy. Yeah, she's funny now that she's apparently like finished her doctorate or whatever right um i love that she like corrected uh the the one asshole sword guy um who referred to her as miss she was like doctor thank you yeah like, <laughs> like eat shit dude. <laughs> um no she was she was great um yeah and then i mean hayward is sort of our evil third, military guy yeah josh stamberg plays a good douchebag um yeah and look you need you need those characters, right? Like you need right. you need those like hyper pro military type characters in the MCU that everyone goes, you're the worst. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and of course I mean, Marvel is like, we're gonna have that guy try to shoot a kid. <laughs> like, God, right? Sorry. And like honestly, much as Hayward was like cartoonishly evil. Yeah, he was. By, by the, the end, end, he definitely was. Um, 
really the only like evil character we got was Hayward. Um, right. We still sort of needed Hayward. Yeah, for you do. The you fact do. of like spurring Wanda to create a new vision and all this other stuff. Like Hayward, minor, just a shitty, evil, militaristic douchebag, but catalytic to the events of the series. Right, exactly. And, and what I also like is the MCU never, never has a problem in taking these like. It, like it when you go back to like Winter Soldier and actually no you know that's a lie when you go back to Avengers and forward there is a big through point and I guess you could even go all the way to Iron Man but there's a big through point from Avengers on about like the military or sort of these high level people that are not like superheroes that always want to like they're all like copies of general ross's sort of mindset right like <laughs> we have to control these weapons we need to use these weapons i mean you know, case in point in avengers like the board of you know the top board of shield or whatever uh, I, I forget what the council they were just like oh no that's fine just nuke new york <laughs> like I, i'm sorry what no no just nuke it it's fine you just uh, nuke it. yeah like they didn't they just have no regard for sort of the for humanity what? Like, they just don't. Right. Like, they're like, look, these are ultimate things that need to happen. And Robert Redford's character in Winter Soldier was just like, don't care. Like, I just don't care. Uh, I just want to take shit over. And I want to just put a bullet in anybody who's going to oppose us, like, early on. So those kind of things, I, I think, are important. And Hayward is in that long line of those kind of characters. Um, yep. But again, like you said, he's catalytic um, to get wanted to do uh, what she needed to do. And... I like that he lied to get, again, a nice red herring to get everyone to believe that Wanda came in, you know, blew the doors off the place and just stole right. vision. And she was like, yo, I didn't do that. Like, I was sad. Right. And I drove that, to this like, sad not, town. Not that him lying and then Wanda having these, like, hallucinations of dead bodies yeah. um, in in the midst of her grief because she was reminded of their deaths and whatnot. Um that, you know, for the first half of the series, we were led to believe that she was puppeteering the Vision's corpse. Yeah, which is pretty dark, by the way. And it wasn't really until we saw, you know, what actually happened in episode eight that it was like, oh, that, you know, that image she saw of dead Vision was a hallucination. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, that was clever. And again... Using Hayward as an ability, like as a as a way to confuse the audience and thinking that Wanda is more vicious than she is is, is clever, right? Mm -hmm. It's clever. Um, look, I I thought the world of WandaVision, the series was great. Like, I mean, we talked about it sort of at nauseum. Just going from black and white, you know, Dick Van Dyke style, all the way up to Malcolm in the Middle. Um, was just clever like it, it just it just is quite good the or modern design family. was impeccable yeah um, it was but not not just the set design but it's like you know this uh making of the assembled doc mm -hmm. uh that they that they released a few days ago now um hi really highlights they they were using the same kind of camera lenses and the same sort of lighting techniques and the same sort of yep staging and all of this stuff with this you know classic sitcom multi-camera setup um and it's brilliant and it, it results in a world that's very believable as a sitcom but then becomes just as believable as your sort of expected mcu vibe as well yeah yeah i look I, like i appreciated the level of detail that they went into uh one of which um this is a side note i have been searching for the last number of years for a particular outdoor fireplace. It's an outdoor indoor fireplace. And they had it in the first two episodes <laughs> in their house. And I was like, that's a 1950s pre-way fireplace. And I want one. Like, they're really hard to find. Um, yeah, and I was so jealous. Expensive. Yeah, they're yeah. fucking expensive. Um, but, like, even, like, details like that, which are things, like, from the Dick Van Dyke show. Like, by the way, they literally went to Dick Van Dyke and were like, hey, we need, like, we have questions and like, how did you guys just, and you know, he's a thousand years old and he's like, oh, this is how you do it. Um, so like those kind of things are a big deal. Like they went to people who know the it. First two episodes 
in classic old school sitcom style, like a play in front of an actual live audience. audience. Those yeah, were not right. Canned laugh tracks. Right. Those were actual human people reacting to what was happening, which is awesome. Um, brilliant. Honestly. Yeah. Like again, the care that they use. You can say whatever you want about the MCU at being cookie cutter or what have you, which I think is really silly, especially this after this. Goes a long way to disprove this cookie yeah. cutter mentality people have about it. Too. Right, and and not only that, like. I think there's a number of movies that, that, that break that, right? But, but the idea, the idea of the care that they take to make this a unique experience is very cool. And then to th- then somehow fit it into the MCU and make it make sense is yeah. also, uh, you know, incredible. Um, look, uh, favorite moments, not just characters. Um, I, look, I would have to say one of my all time favorite moments in the series is, the moment where they're in the kitchen arguing, I think it's like maybe episode four or five. They're arguing. It rolls the credits. And it rolls the credits. <laughs> and Vision is like, nah, fuck that. And he <laughs> walks in through the other room. And then they have that argument and they float and they're like, they're, they're yelling at each other. That was uh, awesome. Honestly, that like was cool. every aspect of Wanda, like, controlling, like, the broadcast elements of yeah. the sitcom world. Of her like rewinding and resetting when things aren't going the way that she wants she wanted them, them to. to. Go. Um, yeah, I yeah. mean, and the, the more the rolling the credits over Vision trying to argue, with it was him. like, yeah, 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 you're That's done. Funny. He was like, no, nah, I'm not. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> but one of the things that it was pointed out in a, in another review I saw, which I like, I, I don't remember the guy's name, so I I apologize. I, otherwise, I give credit because I thought it was a really smart observation. He's you know he said like look. One of the things that's super interesting is that scene where they're floating and arguing um, at each other is actually Wanda arguing with herself. Which is like when you think about the things that Vision did inside, you know, inside the hex and trying to get out of the hex, all of that is Wanda's doing. Like, and it's like, it's weird that she gave him a level of agency over everyone else. Yeah, it's basically the only people inside the hex that have that seemingly have a degree of agency over their own actions besides Wanda are Vision, which was created by Wanda, um, Agatha, and maybe the kids. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So that that was that was kind of dope to to then realize, like going back, that she was actually and some part of therapy is having to acknowledge things, right? Like so she's literally having an argument, a therapeutic session with herself, which is just fascinating. Yeah. Uh, speaking of therapy, I thought the whole revisiting of Wanda's past. Oh, uh, amazing. Amazing episode. Because that's basically Agatha being like, we're going to therapy today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, that was actually my favorite episode. Like, oh, even yeah. after the series ended, yes. like, b- just because that filled in so much, right? That The fact that it highlighted the fact that these, that they didn't get powers from the right. Mind Stone, that their powers were already there and were amplified by the Mind Stone. Right. And I think that's oh. smart because that's a lovely little retcon now that you own Fox characters, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that, sure again, is. they gave themselves just enough space in their writing. And they, of course, I don't think they like, I don't think they're like geniuses where they're like, well, let's make sure that we have enough space in case one day we could. No, I don't think right, so. No. I think they were just like, uh, Mind Stone, boom, done. Like, we're never getting them back. And then because they never showed that, right. they had the space to do it. And that's, that's super dope. Smart. It's just like uh, now to, to get that out of the way now and never have to talk about it again. Everyone's like, yeah, got it. Cool. Yeah. Understand it. Um, for it, me, go ahead. big, big favorite moment, like my, like across the series, personally, the reveal of Agatha's witch dress was like, oh yeah. When she, like the so, Agatha all like, along when, thing. Like, yeah. It was you dope. see, you see the bottom of it in Agatha all along, which in itself is like, it's a great moment. Top tier moment. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and I will talk about that in a second. But like the reveal of the full witch dress, I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they didn't, uh, they didn't, my wife. they didn't like, <laughs> they didn't MCU it. Like they just no. gave you like an a real like, like this is what witches like in you know in media look like, right? Like yeah. flowing robes and stuff. They did like Scarlet Witch is having having her. Very MCU outfit makes sense for who the character is. But Agatha was like, nah, fuck that. 
Like I might as well have like a I might as well have like a, a hat. So of course, she, like it's going to look a little more classically witchy. Yeah, um, which, I, which I appreciate. Agatha all along, like people went nuts for it because it's such an earworm. But I want to talk about the music because, like, all of the various sitcom intros, I also thought were brilliantly handled by the Lopez's because mm-hmm. they use this four note motif that carried across all of them. And you, you know, the way that they used it, they sort of disguised it in a couple different chord progressions and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you hear it the most with the Wanda vision, Wanda vision, right. like that, that four notes that da, na, 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 that's the, the motif for Wanda vision. And then Agatha all along also uses that as like the first part of that baritone sax riff. Mm-hmm. And it's brilliant. And they like released a sort of a music theory explainer after the fact of like the reason why you were so ready to hear Agatha all along. Oh, interesting. Episode seven was because you had been hearing this same riff over and over and over again for the last six weeks. Jesus. But see, that's like like, to me just sort of hung out in the back of your head because it wasn't quite as obvious every single time. See, but that again, the care that you take to do the music like that over, over a series like this, that's clever, man. Like, you cannot ignore the work it takes to go, okay, well, let's, let's add some music theory as to how we're going to introduce this character's big reveal, right? Like, that's, that's amazing. Like, wow, incredible. Um, one of the other things I, the two other moments I really loved. Um, I love the moment with the family, like in the center of town, right? Like, that just, I was like, I love this. Like, hell yeah, they're all going to fight. Like, that was so, that was dope, right? And just the line, delivered by um wanda to to the kids like look we never trained you for this but you were born for this right like and i thought that was cool because very incredible right and it literally like the the pose that they did was like right out of the out of the incredibles movie i was like i was all in i was like this is it right i was so hyped for that um there's nothing better than a superhero family fighting together it's awesome um so i i love that moment and it like didn't fully pay off because it was more the parents like all right, we got to go and like <laughs> do the real fighting. Um, but what it did set up for is Wiccan and Speed to come back, right? Like you weren't trained for this, but you were born for this. Like when you come back, like your characters are going to be a big deal. So yeah. I, I like that moment of getting those kids. Those kids aren't given powers and they're like, I don't know what to do. I'll make popcorn fast, right? Like, they actually had a moment like where Wiccan catches the bullet and, you know, drops it or, you know, in speed, you know, I, I think he like knocks. He know, like runs around them all real quick and like knocks all their guns down. Guns down, down right. Like, yeah. So like I, I appreciated those kind of things because um, it, like it's not just in the moment, but it's also telling for, you know, like um, sort of future future storylines. Um, and then the other thing was vision versus vision. I, I thought was really dope. Um just it's exactly how i expected that concept right like you they're they're too like impossible to beat beings you're not just gonna like punch each other for 30 minutes that's stupid what is he gonna do throw each other into the sun like no they're going to have a conversation because hex vision is going to be like i'm not the real vision (laughs) yeah you can't hurt me it's like this is a valid point (laughs) i gotta go i request elaboration yeah so i i just i appreciated that they they smart guide it and then just like meathead fight, right? They had a little bit of a meathead fight for a while. And it's like, dude, I'm you like, you're not going to like, you're not going to beat me. Like that's ridiculous. So I thought that was a smart and intelligent way. And then using the ship of Theseus, like again, this movie isn't made by a jock douchebag or this series isn't made by a jock douchebag. These are people really thinking about these characters and what they would or wouldn't do. Right. Like, so it's smart. I, I really, I really liked the way that Wanda and Vision said goodbye to the kids, and then the way that Wanda and Vision said goodbye to each other. I was like, "Yeah, that was a powerful. <laughs> that's powerful. Yeah. That's super powerful. Like, yeah, man. They don't, they don't just go. Oh, the kids are gone. Like, no. Like, they literally put them to bed, um, and and allow the hex to, you know, to shrink around them. Um, yeah, no. It, it." When it's all over for those characters seeing each other, I mean, Vision's line is amazing. Like, we've said hello to each other, you know, 
you know, multiple times. Or and, it's, um, or we've, we've said goodbye. Said goodbye before. It's Sans to say, we'll say hello, hello again. again. And, I just, and I was just like, yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> also. I little of my feelings about that. Right. Like, you know. why do I care about this robot, man? Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and to that, and also to that regard, the line that he says, I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention it. The line that he says, you know. What is, you know, what is grief, if not love, uh, persevering? persevering? And it's just like, yo, that is some top notch writing. Um, but again, they are working, they're working these lines in, in these moments with these two great actors where it's a woman with witch powers talking to a robot a man. Robot, right. <laughs> like, I, I, but they I, make I it work. If you, if you had, less talented actors in these roles these lines maybe wouldn't carry the same sort of weight no you know? and i think a lot of these lines come super heavy coming out of paul bitney's mouth right like that line in that line delivery you're just like it's like a real actor <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> um almost like he's a classically trained yeah he really <laughs> is right so it I don't think I don't think it comes. It doesn't feel the same like coming out of Chris Hemsworth's mouth, right? Like it just, no. I just don't. And that's not that's not a knock of Chris Hemsworth. It's just not. He's not the same type of actor. So, um, for that, I think they like super nailed it. Yeah. Um, the only suggested improvement I have, honestly, is that I would have liked to see a little bit more of of Monica Rambeau um, in the series. Um, but again, I understand why not, because you're teeing that up for a much bigger moment. So yeah. that's really my only issue. I, I, I was I really impressed overall. I think for me, um, yeah, I mean, much the same. I, I would have wanted more of a conclusive end of the storyline for not just Monica, but also Darcy and Jimmy, because it felt yeah. like their storylines all just sort of dried up. At the end, we didn't really get much of a conclusion for any of them. Um, now, some interviews have come out in the last week that suggest that there were scenes that were shot that would have handled this better um, with them, like, investigating Agatha's basement and learning that Senior Scratchy was actually a demon um, rather than that just being alluded to. Right. That, like, we actually get that confirmed. Um, but it, it appears that due to the conditions brought on by the pandemic, um, they weren't really able to render the visual effects for those scenes in time. So it's like they were shot, they were written, they were shot, but they, they were cut basically due to time. So, um, I would love to see if these scenes eventually get finished and released sometime yeah. down the road. I think that would be great. Um, yeah. Release the woo cut. All right. I got it. <laughs> uh, the other thing, I mean, I, Honestly, like, this is such a non-starter, but, like, I wish we got Deborah Jo Rupp in the 70s episode. You know? Yeah, that <laughs> feels like a missed opportunity. Oh, right. She was in the 50s episode. And, I mean, they brought her in basically because she is such a quintessential sitcom mom. Um, yeah. She knows sitcoms so well. And I think having her around the set probably helped the rest of the crew out quite a bit. Um I thought yeah, she was great. That is a missed opportunity not to not to have her in a seventies. <laughs> yeah, come on, man! Like, like just bring her in. Like, it would have been dope. Like to bring her in and just have her say "dumbass" once. Like, just as a connection to the seventies show. Like, that would have been awesome. Like, just once. Um, yeah, I, I think they someone specifically said that um, Wanda's hair in the seventies episode was taken basically from Donna from that seventies show. I mean, it looks a lot like Donna's. Yeah, I could see that. So that's it. Um, so yeah, those are my only like. I really don't have that many improvements because I thought it was really good. Um, yeah. How it fits in the overall MCU? I think we've talked a, a, a lot yeah. about that. Um, it's a quirky corner of the MCU, but what it does is it, much like the Mandalorian for Star Wars, it fills in a lot of gaps, um, and that's good. I think it. I think it makes Age of Ultron a better movie. Um, if you weren't like too keen on that, like kind of watch that movie with the knowledge that you have from WandaVision and see if it doesn't kind of fill out a little bit more for you. Hmm. If you felt it lacking, it certainly for me, I, I think it does. Um, and then, yeah, like where it fits in the MCU, we got Monica has powers. Now Wiccan and speed exist somewhere in the universe. Some Agatha exists. Vision is back in some capacity. Wanda is now the Scarlet witch. Ah, they said the name. Yeah. Um, she's got a new costume, which looks dope. Got a wonderful new costume. Yes. Um, 
I think it's like it's worth stressing that like Wanda probably exists in way more of a gray area than she did even before. Oh, one hundred percent. As Agatha was keen to point out, heroes don't torture people. Right, and, and you Wanda were, and you're supposed to, you're supposed to destroy the world for a week, two right. weeks in in her own grief, um, and you know. It took a lot for her to to let them out. You know, she was subjecting people to harsh psychological torture right. for probably a week or two. Right. For her own benefit. For her own benefit. So for her own benefit. So, so uh it'll be interesting to see how or really what kind of consequences she ends up facing. Yeah, I, I would like to see some some more consequences for her. I didn't mind that they weren't happening in this series because I don't the I mean, MCU what were the people of Westview going to do besides be like, fuck you, get out of here. Like Yeah. Uh, she's yeah, a I'll, god. Yeah. <laughs> I'll throw you all into the sun. Shut up. <laughs> right. Enjoy your last week. Um so yeah, I I'd like to see her pay maybe some consequences or figure out some way to do like some retribution for it. Right. Like she doesn't necessarily like, we're going to put you in magic jail. Right. Like it doesn't have to be something like that. Cause like, what are you going to do? Um, but maybe she figures out a way to have like some like restitution for that town. Like, you know, something she figures out like, Hey, this was wrong. I'm going to try to help them or, you know, something, yeah. something it, it, it'd be nice. I hope they don't leave that kind of hanging. Um, and then, you know, that sort of ties into the last point, which is characters in the, in, you know, going forward in the MCU. Look, Wanda's supposed to be a big part of, um, uh, into, uh, the multiverse of madness. Um, so that, that seems cool. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, she was told by Agatha that she's more powerful than the Sorcerer Supreme. So, like, She's got the dark hold and, and he's going to be like, Hey, what are you doing with that dark hold? And she's like, mind your business. And look, maybe they got a wizard fight coming and I'm okay with that. Like, right. I feel like they're probably going to butt heads and then like, yeah, we're both heroes. So we're probably going to have to come together here. But my guess is they're going to butt heads a couple times in that movie. I mean, again, this is, you know, the Wanda's powers are all innate. They're all natural. They, they weren't learned. They're just something she has. So I feel like. Her natural ability is going to naturally butt heads with uh, Doctor Strange's learned abilities, right? Um, and the knowledge that he has. So, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Wanda again. I'm looking forward to seeing Vision again, and I'm really looking forward to seeing Agatha. Again. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll leave it there. Um, that was our uh, series review for WandaVision. This was only supposed to be 30 minutes, but uh, we couldn't stop talking. Um, oh, well, <laughs> I, lo- I loved it. I thought it was super good. Yeah, so um, if you haven't watched WandaVision on Disney+, Plus, do yourself a favor. Um, and if you have watched it, watch it again um, in between new episodes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So um, check WandaVision out on Disney+, Plus, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.